What's up, guys? We're back again. I'm here with uh, David Lee Corbo. He's going to run us through this ad read. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Guys, before we start the show, don't forget to go to toplobster.com. Click on the upper hand, left hand corner on the menu and go to the drop down that says brand. You'll find Nephilim Death Squad merch under there where we've got all of our super dope designs. Uh, a couple of my pa personal favorites are the Red Heifer End Times shirt. I think it's an appropriate shirt to be wearing lately. How cool would it be if they're sacrificing a red heifer on live TV and you're wearing the shirt? Uh, or if you're one of the couples that listen to the show, because we do have couples that listen to the show. There's a, there's an actual romantic element to Nephilim Death Squad. So maybe <laughs> then the best shirt for you is Nephilim and Chill. If you and the lady are watching the show together, what a better shirt than that. And if you're looking for a conversation starter, my personal choice would be the Ask me about the Nephilim shirt. If you really want to get into terribly awkward situations where you suddenly have to explain uh, the sons and daughters of, or the daughters of man having sex with fallen angels and giving birth to Nephilim, then that's the shirt for you. This one uh, and here, guys, don't uh, forget. This one here will actually be at uh, the Sam Tripoli show. I have a couple of these, so... When you're out there to see us, um, I, I'm, I'm bringing some merch that's going to be scattered, like some stickers, some of this stuff. I'm actually going to have some shepherd slings. Uh, come through. Don't forget about We're gonna that. Have some, you're going to have yes. shepherd slings? Don't, listen, <laughs> yeah. be professional. Join the Telegram. Guys, we'll see you in a minute. We're going to start the show. All right? We are being hypnotized by people like this. News readers, politicians, teachers, lecturers. We are in a country... And in a world that is being run by unbelievably sick people, the chasm between what we're told is going on and what is really going on is absolutely enormous. Oh yeah, dude. There's some Nephilim shit. It's like we all know what's going down, but no one's saying shit what happened to the home of the brave. Cause they can tell this now And no one's talking about how they made us out of these slaves And everybody's just walking around Heading the clouds and won't awaken to a dead in the grave But then it's too late, we need to be ready to raise up Welcome to the end of day Everybody is slaves away. Welcome back to Nephilim Death Squad I am David Lee Corbo, a.k.a. The Raven That's Top Lobster And today we are joined by Timothy Alberino uh, Mr. Alberino, can you tell the audience a little bit about what it is that you do and where they can find your work? It's a very entertaining intro you have there. Um, <laughs> I'm an author, researcher, and explorer, lecturer, filmmaker. And um, you can find my work on YouTube. Um, I'm on social media, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. I have a website, timothyalberino.com. I've made films. I've written a book called Birthright. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, I'm all over the place and I'm doing a lot of different things. So, but, um, I talk about, uh, I research topics related to, uh, biblical studies, uh, UFOs, giants, ancient civilizations, alternative theories and alternative history, etc. You know, Tim, uh, one of the questions I always have is uh, how did you, how did, how does one get into this? I know how I kind of got into it. We kind of, we kind of get pushed in by like maybe circumstances in our lives where you start to notice, um, for us, the, the Christian religion more in a more intimate way, in a more real way. So I went down this rabbit hole, but how does someone like you become basically like a uh, Indiana Jones? Where do you, where do you start off on your life going down this path? Well, I dropped out of high school when I was 18, dropped dropped out slash got kicked out of high school when I was 18 years old. And I moved to the Amazon basin of Peru. And that's kind of where things began for me. Um, I lived in Peru for a decade. Then I came back to the States and I was uh, living in Cleveland, Ohio for a couple of years. That's where I was born and raised Cleveland, Ohio. And I ended up interfacing with a gentleman named Steve Quayle, who's also in this Nephilim space, you might say. And uh, I ended up moving out to Bozeman, Montana to work with Steve. We created a company called Gen 6 Productions, and we began to produce some documentary films and did some other things, um, conferences and 
and the like. And so that's kind of what launched me, I would say, uh, in a professional manner. I've always been interested in these kinds of topics, but it became kind of a career for me when I moved out to Bozeman and began to work with uh, Steve Quayle. Interesting. You know, uh, over the weekend, I was uh, I was on Netflix and I kind of just put on um, Noah. Never seen it before with with Russell Crowe. And it's I'm just glad that there's people like you. We've got like L.A. Marzulli and, you know, other people, Gary Wayne, who's writing these books that are telling the story much closer to what actually happened than, you know, the Hollywood version of it, where it's I, I watched a couple of minutes and it seems like they're trying to depict the the watchers or the fallen in in a good light. It's almost like, you know, like the classic inversion of what the truth would be. And I, I turned it off. But uh, yeah, thank you for for covering this stuff and, you know, shedding some knowledge on on us because we, we have no idea what we're doing here. It was a wasted opportunity. They had a they had they had an opportunity to uh, depict. Depict the antediluvian world in a in a more realistic way and to tell the story as it is written in Genesis six and the book of Enoch and other extra biblical texts. And they chose to do something completely fantas fan fantas uh, fanciful, excuse me. Um, and it was a missed opportunity and, and it ended up being a, you know, um, very lackluster film. Yeah. See, I think I, that I wouldn't, people I wouldn't call it a missed opportunity. Ahead, Sorry. Yeah. It's, I feel like that is letting whoever is in charge of these things off the hook. And uh, in a way, also, I, as I was listening to you know, some of your previous interviews recently, where we're talking about the government, if we just uh, kind of keep letting them off the hook as if like, oh, you know, they're just kind of, they're just trying to suppress as much as they can. It, to me, it doesn't seem that way as a conspiracy. Theory. It's almost it like damage like control. It's damage control. They know that they know what the story is. Clearly, they've read it and they and they poured a pretty large budget into it and decided to tell something that wasn't the story. In my opinion, is what it seems like. Because why would you avoid this? It's the greatest story ever told. Why would I change it? Well, I I don't know that I would go down a conspiratorial route with the Noah story. I think they make. I mean, anyone who's been paying attention for the last five years, ten years. To Hollywood, uh, they've been making really bad decisions about a lot of stories and many stories that don't have anything to do with the biblical narrative. Um, there's just a lack of creativity, and you have you always they always want to diverge from these from the original narrative and try and create something unique and different. And in this case, you're right they they abandoned one of those interest, interesting stories ever told uh, for a ridiculous concoction that was, that was frankly boring. You touched on it for a second there, this idea that they had an opportunity to paint, the, paint this era in time in a much more fascinating way. Um, and when people think of the story of Noah's Ark, it's kind of like from from the outside looking in, uh, if you're not really paying attention, I would say the general consensus is what like man was corrupt. And so God chose, you know, one man in particular to save a bunch of animals, get them on an ark, and then he punished the world for man's corruption. But there's a lot more going on there. There's a lot more detail and it's a lot more interesting. And I think that we've kind of had these stories. Uh, Maybe whitewashed isn't the best term, but watered down, watered down for sure. They're they're much less potent than they actually are if you're paying attention. What is your contention about maybe what it looked like in the days of Noah? Well, you know the the, the story of Noah is very very old story. Um, it's uh, it was present in ancient Mesopotamia, of course. That I believe, and depending on who you talk to, uh, most scholars would say that. The biblical account of Noah is a derivation of the more ancient Mesopotamian account. I would actually take the opposite view. I think that the Mesopotamian account is a derivation from the original account, um, which comes from the antediluvian world and was passed down through Noah and his sons, and then and then became corrupted um, during the rise of Sumer and, and Akkadia. But um, it it's interesting because. Uh, 
you know that 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 Noah figure in the Mesopotamian account is Utnapishtim, uh, and and you, you find this Noah character all over the world in many different mythologies of variegated cultures across the globe, and and but it's always the same kind of story. There's a there's a global cataclysm. There's a cat. There's a terrible cataclysm. And then there's a remnant of of mankind that survives and and has to repopulate the earth. It's amazing. There are there are hundreds and hundreds of iterations of the Noah story. Um, I subscribe to the biblical narrative, and, and as I said, as I alluded to, I believe that the the Genesis account is is the original narrative. Whether or not the Book of Genesis was penned uh, before or after the Mesopotamian accounts is irrelevant. The oral tradition, I believe, of Noah and his sons that we have in the in the Genesis account is the original story. Um, so I'm sorry, I lost the rest of the, the rest of your question no, there. This actually does bring something to mind where it's like, do you think that this is uh, one man whose name is changed throughout these stories, an event that took place one time? that has changed throughout all these different cultures. Or uh, we just had Vicki Joy Anderson, who is an author uh, who works with L.A. Marzulli. She was just on the show the other day, and she said something that I thought was really interesting. It was this idea that the way that God sent the symbol of the rainbow and promised not to flood the world again, the way that she interpreted it, and she said it was just something that she, she was kind of kicking around this concept of, it struck her as you wouldn't flood the world once and then just say, hey, hey, I'll never do it again. It was almost as if like this is something that had happened. Do you think that there's room for Noah almost being an archetype like this may have happened several times and maybe for some reason there is just this formula almost where God picks a man has the same thing happen again. And then this time is like, and like I said, this isn't something that she uh, was putting a lot of stock into. It was just an interesting thing. And now that I'm hearing you say it, it's like, well, maybe there's room for, this is a multiple occurrence, which is why it echoes through so many different cultures. And maybe it's not necessarily the same man with different names from different cultures, but actually different instances, different moments in time where this same thing happened again. Do you think there's any room for that? I would say that all of these various stories around the world have one original source. Um, but I would also concede that I do believe that the earth had been catastrophically destroyed previous, previous to the flood of Noah. And indeed, from in my estimation, previous to the creation of mankind. So I believe in a pre-Adamic cataclysm that rocked the earth, that something happened, something else is going on here before the creation of mankind and the inception of mankind, and that um, it was even it was it was an even greater cataclysm um, in that context. So I do subscribe to multiple cataclysms going back in in into the past. Um, I don't believe that the flood of Noah was the first. Certainly, in my mind, there was a pre-Adamic cataclysm, and uh, there's lots of reasons why I believe that, and I detail why I believe that in my book, Birthright. Well, they say, uh, um, I don't know, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think they attribute 4,000 or some odd years to when Adam would have been around. How, what's the time frame on that? You mean from Adam to the flood? From Adam to now. Oh, well, um, this is controversial because most Christians are, are, are under the impression that when you go to the Genesis 5 genealogy, which lists the genealogy of the pre-flood pre -flood patriarchs, beginning with Noah and ending, uh, rather beginning with Adam and, and ending with Noah and his sons, um, most Christians will read this genealogy as if it is a, as if it's linear, if it's written in a linear fashion, and it, there's there's a there's a lot of problems with that. That rendering of the text. First of all, the first problem that we have to deal with is that we have the the Masoretic text today, 
we are all reading the Masoretic text. And the Masoretic, the Masoretes, they, for some reason, decided to subtract 100 years off of each of the lifespans of those patriarchs from Adam to Noah, which significantly reduced that period of time uh, from Adam to Noah uh, by some 1,500 years or so, or 1,200 years or so. Well, um, well the, the, we know that the Masoretes sort of circumcised uh, the lifespans of the patriarchs because in the Septuagint, in the Septuagint, you have, uh, which I think is the original rendering, you have 100 additional years under the under the lives of each one of those patriarchs. Why the Masoretes would have done it, who knows? They had their own um, they had their own theological positions that they were wanting to reinforce. There were certain uh, theological topics and themes that they wanted to suppress, um, and so that's the the first problem that we run into when we try and make a linear calculation from Adam to Noah. The second problem is that clearly I think what we have in that genealogy is what's what's referred to as telescoping. And and telescoping means that that you know you imagine a telescope and, and that telescope will fold down into into a smaller um, artifact. And um, so basically what scholars mean by telescoping is Rather than rather than account for all of the individuals in this family line, they remove certain numbers of them so that they can fit the genealogy in a nice, neat number. And this was this was the, the, reaching a particular numerical value was very important to ancient writers, especially the writers of of the Hebrew Hebrew Old Testament. Numerology was was exceedingly important. Um, it, it the number itself was part of the message. It was a part of the communication. And so you find this, this is a known fact. Scholars know that you find this phenomenon of telescoping in other genealogies in the Bible. It's, it's, this isn't speculation. This is happening. The writers, uh, the, the, the Hebrew writers would routinely engage in this sort of thing you know, remove certain people from a genealogy in order to in order to reach a particular number. Again, because this numerology was very important to them. Um, so I think we 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 have some telescoping going on in the account of um, in the genealogy of the pre-flood patriarchs. There are probably more. We we assume that that genealogy represents the father to the firstborn son, and so on, all the way down through the line, the genealogical record. But that, I think, is a is, it's an assumption at best. And I think that um, in reality, we're probably looking at a whole lot longer period of time than Christians are accustomed to counting for or to contemplating in regard to the antediluvian world from the creation of Adam to the flood of Noah. Um, I would say thousands of years transpired, perhaps many thousands of years. I think that the flood of Noah probably took place sometime around 10,000 BC. Now, uh, this is a, a modification to my own view, even the view I put forward in my book, Birthright. I have, since the publishing of that book, modified my view, altered my view based on new information that I was only slightly aware of at the time. And there was an event that took place. Um, there was clearly some sort of a cataclysm that happened around 10,000 BC. Indeed, when you look at the megaliths all around the world, so many of them seem to point to that very period of time based on their alignments with celestial phenomena. And this is, of course, the field of archaeoastronomy, uh, looking at an archaeological ruin and then using the timepiece, that celestial timepiece, to figure out when this, this, let's say, megalithic site aligned with a particular sign, zodiacal sign, um, or a particular constellation. And um, 
and this so has been many the of same, these... the same thing that they used for the Sphinx uh, facing the constellation of Leo. Yes, that would be precisely uh, um, okay. Precisely, and this works because of axial precession, because the Earth is tilted and and wobbles, and so um, this th this was known to the ancients, and they all use the same. They all base they all use the same timepiece, and that we call that the zodiac. And the Hebrews called that the Matzeroth. And it's the same thing. It's the same signs. It's the, 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 the Zodiac is, of course, divided into 12 houses. And each house is represented by a different sign. And this is how the ages were measured. And, uh, and by many, many different cultures, including... This may Hebrews. be going in a different direction, but it's something that I was actually thinking about very recently. So it's interesting that we're here talking about it. But there was a time when I came to understand that a 13th Zodiac had been introduced and it was Ophiuchus, uh, a man uh, uh, struggling with a serpent and or wrestling with a serpent. And then that kind of just fell out of the the kind of, you know, zeitgeist of awareness. I wonder if if you know anything about that or how that applies, because there was this, I think, around maybe 2000 and 2013, 2014, suddenly there was the introduction of this 13th constellation for a brief time that never seemed to really stick around or, or be anything of any significance. But I do remember it was called Ophiuchus, and I do remember it was a man wrestling with a serpent. I don't recall that. I've only been aware of 12, and this is this is certainly understand the ancient understanding is 12. There's 12 ages, and those ages correspond to the what's called a, a great year, which is the the completing the the full wobble of the earth, axial precession. And uh and again, all the ancients knew this. So I don't know, uh I'm not sure how we got onto Zodiac. That could just I be took us here, that so. was <laughs> That's all right. That might have just been me. Uh, if oh, if we, we were, were already lost these. in the woods, I made sure to derail us. We were, was talking, it? You got it? We, were, we were talking about the, the, the Sphinx being aligned to the um, to Leo and. And um, that, you know, that was sometime around 10,000 B.C. And not only the Sphinx in in Egypt, but also in Peru, I believe that the that. The city of Cusco, for example, and this this is was confirmed through the research of my my friend and colleague uh, Andre Satazme, who's an archaeoastronomer, um, who figured out that the city of Cusco was founded in 10,000 BC based on the alignment of the megaliths. Uh, I think there, I think that uh, 10,000 BC is probably when um, that the cataclysm. Occurred. So you're looking at some 12,000 years ago, which, of course, aligns with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis that Graham Hancock has made famous um, and Randall Carlson. And the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis posits that 12,000 years ago, around 10,000 BC, there was an earth shattering cataclysm. And that that resulted from a, a an an asteroid impact on the North American ice sheets, the Laurentide ice sheet to be specific, and perhaps other, other locations in North America. It was, in fact, not just one impact, but a series of impacts because there was a large asteroid that broke up, uh, that broke up um, and, and broke up in orbit and fragments of it bombarded the Earth. And that that was... Uh, that precipitated this this cataclysm that that uh, annihilated humanity, that destroyed much of the life on Earth, the megafauna, certainly the megafauna extinction, and 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 almost entirely eradicated the human species. I think that 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 is the cataclysm, uh, the the Noahic flood. I believe that that is the cataclysm that all of these other ancient civilizations r refer to and that it and that it in fact did happen sometime around 10,000 BC. So I would push the flood of Noah back to 10,000 BC. And again, the only contention that Christians can can make in regard to this this time frame is but the Genesis 5 genealogy 
only allows for however many years it is. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, basically, to 3300 BC, thereabouts, um, would have been the flood of Noah, according to that calculation. And uh, it's just it's it's very uh, it's not a it's a tenuous position because again the masoretic text for some reason subtracted 100 years off of the lifespans of the patriarchs so you have to start there um i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to fall back to the septuagint before i'm going to the septuagint as i said has 100 additional years on the lifespans of those patriarchs and i'm i'm going to put more confidence in the in the reckoning of the septuagint than in the masoretic text so that's, again, the first problem. And the second problem is this issue of telescoping. So um, it's not as concrete as most Christians think it is. It's just not at all. It's completely up for debate. And, um, and uh, again, you have to take into account the, the megaliths are, I think, the remnant they're the they're it's all that's left from the antediluvian world that's all that could have survived are these massive megalithic foundations and so you have to take into account the the archaeo astronomical alignments of these megaliths because they're they're very precisely aligned you can't just discount that data because you know your mass your masoretic bible says there were this many years from noah to from adam to noah no, you have to take the compendium of evidence and and use the correct measurements, and the correct measurement of time is the zodiacal ages. So um, so anyway, 10,000 BC, that's when I would I would push the flood back. And this is a this is an amendment to the way I used to think um, years ago. I've I've as I said, since I published my book, I've I've amended this position. Well, you know, uh, good on you, man, because uh, a lot of what uh, a lot of what is wrong with humanity now, or at, at least cur the current civilization, is people kind of pick a side and then they get married to it. Can't let that die. So good on you for having, an, you know, continuing your research and and changing your mind. Um, I wanted to ask. So after this flood, um, how do these guys survive? Because I know that there's there's accounts. There's definitely one that I. I'm pretty sure it's verifiable. We're talking about uh, the the giant from Afghanistan. This is just one, uh, but we know that they are still Nephilim around. Um, you know, this is an ongoing debate. How did the Nephilim survive the flood? And the older I get, the more irrelevant it seems. Um, it, it it depends on how you view the flood. First of all, there's a lot of good scholarship in regard to the flood of Noah not being global. And what I mean by global is not every single mountain on planet Earth was submerged in water. Um, there are several, there, I would, there, there are basically three positions on the flood of Noah. You have what, what would might be considered the traditional position, at least the traditional Protestant position, which would be that the flood of Noah was global and that every mountain peak was covered in water um, all over the earth. That would be the traditional view. Then I would say that another view would be a local flood theory in which the Levant, the Fertile Crescent was flooded and it was a local phenomenon, a local cataclysm. And that was the known world to the people at the time. And um, so that's, you know, that's the local flood hypothesis. And then there's one that I think is kind of in between. And this is the one that I subscribe to, which is a global cataclysm hypothesis. In other words, the entire earth was rocked by cataclysm. Every continent was affected by this cataclysm and it had dire effects all over the earth, um, not just not just in in regard to flooding by the way if indeed we're talking about a an asteroid impact or a series of asteroid impacts on the ice sheets in on the north american ice sheets then obviously you would have flooding for sure but you would also have um you would also have 
raging forest fires everywhere all over the earth as the fragments the the molten hot fragments of the impacts are discharged for for miles perhaps even thousands of miles and landing in force and setting those forests ablaze so you would have mass burning of the of, of the um uh, forests on earth all over the earth and you would also obviously have floods you would have earthquakes you would have there there would be there would be the fallout would be considerable and it would manifest in many different ways, not just flooding. And it would affect the, the whole earth. These, the, um, uh, the temperature and what's the word I'm, I'm looking for here? Saltiness, salinity of the oceans would, would be altered. The, the, it would probably have launched the earth into a, something like a nuclear winter something approximating a, a nuclear winter so you would have a you would have this you would have um the 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 massive forest fires and and you would have a super heating of the atmosphere around the impact area so you would have like the, things would be vaporized but then right after all of this you would the earth would be plunged into a deep freeze because of all of the debris that, that's thrown up into the atmosphere blocking the sun and creating um, creating a, a a kind of nuclear winter, so it would have been absolutely devastating. The entire globe would have been devastated by the cataclysm. So um, I subscribe to this view that the entire world was affected by the cataclysm. Civilization, especially in in, in an ancient context, um, was founded. The great cities were usually founded on the banks of rivers or or on the or on, in the coastal areas, and these are precisely the areas that would have been submerged. There would have been you know mile high tidal waves generated from these impacts, and from the all of that ice, the the melt of the ice water, uh, rather the uh, the freshwater melt from the from the glaciers. Um, you would have had you would have had just devastating flooding if you, if you lived anywhere near the sea your city would be underwater um but if you're more inland you would have perhaps been more affected by the 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 wildfires or and even, uh, the earthquakes economic i mean to think that there wasn't you know it's kind of some, some sort of advanced economics and trade going on agriculture going on back then all that stuff is even today if that's slightly disrupted you're looking at a you know, mass deaths. They, I, they were talking about if the internet goes down, people are going to die in probably. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, it's just the tiniest little, you know, push of a button. And That's right. It's still in our nature, right? We're doing the same thing. All of our cities are still coastal. You know what I mean? It's like all we are is one uh, oceanic yeah. cataclysm away from destroying these coastal cities. And what happens when the animals die? Because yeah. you, have, you have a mass, you have a mass die off of the fauna and you're talking about you're talking about a, 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 a an extinction level event that's unfolding in the world and then you know all of the repercussions you it would be very very difficult to survive very difficult to survive under those circumstances um so Again, I subscribe to that view, which is kind of in the middle of the local flood and the global flood. And people, of course, will raise contentions immediately and say, doesn't the Bible say every mountain was underwater and so on and so forth, and the waters covered the whole earth? The answer is yes and no. Um, there are, again, the, the scholarship is, when if you read the papers on the, on the, on the, extens the extent of the flood, you're going to find uh, various opinions by many different scholars based on the terminology. So no, it's not it's not black and forth. It's not black and white as people suppose. Just like the genealogy, the pre-flood patriarchal genealogy. You know, we want for some reason we we so many Christians, and I'm a Christian. We have this need for things to be uh, for things to be simplified and and concrete black and white and and we for some reason people need it to be that way but the but the reality is it's not 
It's not. So many things that we think are concrete are not in regard to um, the Old Testament. And again, um, there's a lot of scholarship on the flood of Noah, and there's a lot of different positions, or at least a few different positions with a lot of commentary. And you could, if you take the text, and I'm not a scholar, I'm not an ancient language expert, but if you, but I've, I've read the work by, I've read a lot of the scholarly articles, and you could, we have a particular rendering in, in our Bibles in regard to the flood of Noah, but you could easily derive a different rendering. Um, and based on the, uh, based on the way the words that are used in Hebrew and Aramaic and so forth. So it's, it's just not as simple as people think. So that's a very long answer uh, to your original question, which was how could have, let's say the Nephilim survived. Um, well, there's, there's a variety of answers and it depends on, it depends on where you fall in, in terms of the extent of the flood. If you believe that the flood of Noah was in fact global and every mountain was underwater mount everest was underwater if that's if that's what you believe you have to you have to come for some things if that's what you believe like how how did the how did the aquatic life survive it wasn't on the ark and if okay. you take salt if you take creatures who who are equipped to live in the ocean in that saltwater environment and you suddenly dilute that saltwater environment those creatures are going to die um, so you have to account for the oceanic life, the aquatic life surviving in those circumstances. And the ecosystem is is intricately connected. You know, you can't have one ecosystem survive and all the other ones collapse. So it might be I might be just uh, speaking out of my my ass here. But uh, <clears throat> what's the salinity like salinity like in the ocean as you go deeper? Because when you start to get to like deep sea fishing, you're pulling stuff up that looks historic. I, I mean, ancient. I don't know. Prehistoric. Really... Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I just know that the ecosystem is very delicate. It's very <laughs> delicate. It cannot, you know, you can destroy an ecosystem by just modifying a few factors. You yeah. can devastate an ecosystem. It's very delicate. So, and if you're talking about a global flood where every square inch of the ground is covered with water, there's it's just there's no way. I mean, what are these sea creatures e really going to survive on when the ecosystem on land has collapsed, is gone? Um, it's just un it's really untenable if you think about it. So. Um, so, again, if you subscribe to this notion that every single mountain, every square inch of planet Earth was underwater, then you're really only left with a couple of options in regard to how the Nephilim, we know how Noah and his family made it through the flood. They were divinely, providentially protected. They were, they were carried through the flood. Um, and we know that, but what about the Nephilim? Well, you, 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 ha you, you have to subscribe to really one of two um, scenarios. One is that, there was another incursion, which is called the second incursion. That the that the that what happened in Genesis six at Genesis six affair reoccurred. It happened again. I have a problem with that because the consequence was so severe. The punishment was so severe uh, after the first incident that it's hard to imagine a group of watchers getting together and repeating it right away. It just yeah. was so severe. And the judgment against the watchers was was evident. It was seen by the rest of the heavenly host. So it's very difficult for me to imagine that just it just happened again. Um, and and there is no account of a second incursion. Why would there be such a detailed account of the first one, but not the second one? Where's the second incursion? Show me in any biblical or extra biblical text. Where's the second incursion? It's just not there. It's non-existent. So um, I don't Mr. subscribe Albert, to the. Quick question. Um, so after the watchers are judged, um, and some are locked up, how many are locked up? How many are are two hundred watchers and they're all condemned and imprisoned, all of them. Even Lucifer. Well, he wasn't a part of those watchers. That's a different scenario. Um so returning to this to finish this thought, to answer to finish the answering your previous question. Um so there's the second incursion. 
and then the other the other hypothesis if you subscribe to every square inch of the earth being underwater is that the genetic markers of the giants of the nephilim made it through the flood via the genomes of noah's sons or more specifically noah's sons wives and even more specifically uh ham and and his wife and and their offspring so um okay that's a possibility i i, I that is plausible certainly um but if you subscribe to my position, a local flood, or to my position, which would be a global cataclysm, um, then the answer is actually even, even simpler. There were places on Earth that were less affected, that were more survivor, survivable, although nearly all of humanity was destroyed. Um, indeed, nearly all of the animals. Um, there might have been pockets, places on earth where the Nephilim, the offspring of the Watchers, and, and, and other kinds of creatures might have been able to survive um, that where the ecosystem was still intact and it, it, and it, it was uh, much less devastated by the cataclysm. So that's a very simple answer. Um, yeah. And, it, and, and again, everyone's going to want to go back to the Masoretic text and say, but it says, you know, they're going to, in the comments of your video, they're going to say, it says in, you know, this verse and this verse that everything that had breath and every mountain, and I'm just telling everyone right now that it's not as cut and dry as you think. You see, I'm not a scholar. I'm assuming you guys are not scholars. We are casual Bible readers. How could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> we are casual Bible readers and including myself, but we have access to scholarship, to the individuals whose careers are to, to learn these dead languages and understand the different meanings and potential meanings of things and, and to avail ourselves of their work. And when you do that, you realize it's just, as I said, not as cut and dry as you think. There's, there's a lot of possibility. There's a lot of flexibility in these stories. Now, lest anyone accuse me of not believing in the Bible, I absolutely subscribe to the biblical narrative, and I don't think there's any leeway as it pertains to the gospel of Christ. That is cut and dry. So don't think that I'm extending this flexibility in the, the, the biblical flood narrative or the genealogy of, of the pre-flood patriarchs to the gospel of Christ. Certainly not. That's a completely different situation for many reasons. So. Um, and you asked the question that uh, I don't recall. You had another oh, about question. Lucifer? Oh, that's right. And that's a good question because there is some confusion here. And, um, and people might be wondering where I'm deriving some of my understanding of this material from. The, uh, everyone knows that the Genesis 6 account is, is like two sentences, right? Um, the Genesis account is not the full account, obviously, of the pre-flood world. There was one that pre precedes it, from which the Genesis account is is drawing. Uh, and that's clear, that's evident for many reasons. And I believe that among other uh, manuscripts, the Book of Enoch, I think, is central here to understanding the first Enoch, specifically the reality and the historic the historicity of the antediluvian world and so when you talk about the watchers and how many watchers were there you you can't reference anything in the biblical text you have to go to the book of enoch well they say a and, third but that could be who knows well, the biblical text, you know, it makes this reference to a third of the angels. There's a lot of contention around this. Um, some people think that that's a future thing. Um, so that's that's a separate that's a separate issue. When you talk specifically about Genesis six and the Watchers, you are referencing specifically two hundred Watchers who descended to the earth in the days of Jared. Two hundred, uh, and all two hundred of those Watchers are are bound in chains. Uh, and darkness, as Peter and Jude allude to, and and will be in this condition until the great judgment. 
and this is another misconception here, there is no indication either in the biblical text and certainly not in the book of Enoch that any of these watchers are going to be released at the end of the age. They are, they are bound until, the, as the book of Enoch puts it, are bound until the age is fully consummated, until the great judgment. So um, there is no release of the watchers. Those 200 watchers are bound in Tartarus, as Peter says. So, um, and in regard to the, in regard to this, this character that we in the West uh, call Satan. Indeed, the New Testament also references him as Satan. Um, this character is not necessarily directly involved in the sin of the Watchers. Now, he may be indirectly involved, and there, but we would have to speculate about that. He may be indirectly involved. And there is some, some indication in First Enoch that that may be the case. But that's also questionable for other reasons. Does but, that mean, uh, sorry to interrupt, but does that mean that he, he, didn't, um, he didn't take part in, in bearing offspring with, the, with the, the men, the daughters of men? Is that what you're saying? No, he did not. Um, okay. Unless... Unless you want to associate Semjaza slash Azazel with Satan, and, and some some scholars do, I personally do not. But what, you'll what find you scholars who will say that Semjaza or Azazel are, in fact, Satan. That's that that's this satanic figure that we find in the New Testament. Um, I do not believe that. There's several reasons why I don't believe that. Uh, but it's important to understand, because now we're delving into the book of Enoch, from which the the story of the Watchers is derived primarily. Um, you, there's, the, it's a, it, the narrative in First Enoch is a composite. It's very clearly a composite narrative. It's not one narrative. There were perhaps a handful of oral traditions or manuscripts that were combined together. And I'm not even talking about Second and third Enoch, that's a completely different topic. I'm just talking about within first Enoch. Um, and this becomes evident when you realize that as you're reading through first Enoch, sometimes Semjaza, or he, he has different renderings of his name based on which edition you're reading the book of Enoch. Sometimes Semjaza is depicted as the, or Semijaza, sometimes his, his name is rendered, is depicted as the ringleader. And sometimes Azazel, this other watcher, Azazel. And then also there's the possibility that these are distinct figures. And I think they are. I don't think they're the same person. I think these are two distinct watchers, Semjaz and Azazel. And I don't think either of them are this, this figure of Satan that we have in the New Testament. I think that he's the original rebel. His defection from the kingdom happened long before the episode with the watchers. In fact, you know, he is that serpent of old, the dragon and the devil who was in Eden. And, and so he was a rebel and a defector before the Watchers because he was in Eden, the Garden of God. So um, there is, and I would, I would argue that there was already a group of defected let's call them defected sons of God, apostate sons of God, inhabiting the earth before the advent of the Watchers. In other words, these 200 Watchers, this was a completely separate episode of defection, of rebellion. And so, you know, sometimes all of these different bad actors in the biblical narrative are conflated, but I think that we can, we can see different episodes and different characters involved. However, I will say, that I do believe that whereas this figure we call Satan was not directly involved in the sin of the Watchers, I do think he was indirectly involved. In other words, he may have been involved in tempting the Watchers, convincing them to do what they did, but he did not himself copulate with a human female and, and thereby progenerate human hybrid offspring um, that is evident because all of the watchers, Simjaza, Azazel, and the rest of them, were all condemned. They were all bound in chains and, and are awaiting the day 
uh, the day of judgment, the final judgment. And if that were the case, if, it, if, if Satan were involved in that group, then he would also be bound in chains. And, and that does not correlate to uh, certainly the New Testament, where we read that Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking who he might devour, right? This idea that the devil is still very much active in the world and and is tempting and, I mean, he's with Jesus in the yeah. desert, in the wilderness, tempting the Son of God. So he's clearly not in chains in Tartarus, in it's... Hades, in, you know, the underworld, or what have you. So, um but that's an important clarification, I think. And it makes, you know, it actually makes a lot of sense because um, there's rules. There are spiritual rules that these beings must play by. Even even the devil himself, you read the book of Job, it's constantly, he's constantly getting consent. Can I do this? Can I then do that? And it's like, yeah, but he's asking first. He's not just yes. doing. So he's, <laughs> he's, he's a, you know, he's a clever fellow. And yeah, wow, that's, a, that's actually a very interesting way to look at it. He's the worst. He's not the worst of the <laughs> of these fallen angels. He's just a well. He might be, but he's not. He wasn't condemned with the Watchers. He wasn't involved in their episode directly. Um, and 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 in regard to the the account in Job, um, you know, there's again going back to the scholarly material. There is contention there as well in regard to who that figure is, if that is in fact. Satan with a capital S or a Satan, um, because Satan is not a, it does not really become a proper title until the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are multiple Satans. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all very nebulous um, in the Old Testament. So, but I do believe that it's clear, it's clear if you read in the biblical narrative that this original rebel Satan with a capital S is permitted to tempt that that is his role. That is, you may, you might consider it to be his, his obligation at this point that he is, that he is permitted to tempt. And, and again, he, he clearly does so with, with Jesus, and he wanted to sift Peter, if you recall. So um, that's an that's an ongoing function of of the devil with a capital D, Satan with a capital S. And I keep saying that because those who are familiar with some of the scholarship in the Old Testament will understand that, that there are devils and satans. That's not always yes. referencing just one particular individual. Um, Satan that being more of a, a descriptive that means the the adversary. Somebody said Satan, Christ, job titles, and angels as well. Oh, Angel means messenger. It's kind of what well, they're you, doing, right? The, the 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 word Satan means adversary, um, and a couple of other words as well that that you you might use. But adversary is basically what it boils down to. So, um, and again, in the New Testament we have the identification of like a capital S Satan, who's the chief of the rebels, the angelic rebels. And that certainly is true. And I make a very strong case for that in my book, Birthright. And, and I subscribe to that notion. I think he is the, 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 uh, the principal rebel and, and perhaps even the first, probably the first. And, and he is involved in this narrative very, very intimately. In fact, I would say there, again, a lot of contention around this statement as well, but I would say that it is that individual, that very individual, the dragon who I, 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 I use the dragon moniker in my book more than any other, um, that, that this capital S Satan figure was in fact the beguiler of Eve in Eden. He was the serpent. It's not a talking snake. I think we all understand that at this point. Um, that it was him. And uh, and he was permitted to do that for very particular reasons. But I would also say that Eden is largely, the Eden story is largely an allegory. So um, anyway. I, uh, 
I wanted to touch on something I've heard you discuss before, and I always wanted the opportunity to hear you elaborate um, if there was any elaboration to be made. But I believe it was actually on the podcast Blurry Creatures, which is a tremendous show. I uh, highly recommend everybody go check out those guys. You were discussing your conversations with uh, people in Peru. And you said that the government of Peru had become very um, touch and go with visitors of your nature because of the series Ancient Aliens. Basically, they had become upset with this idea that you or any other potential visitor might be there to try to paint some some picture uh, that would be, you know, a, a, adapted to a history channel series and because of this you 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 found some resistance uh in trying to do a lot of the things that you set out to do while you were there and you mentioned that the narrative you'll get from the government of peru on how their megalithic structures were made would be one thing but that if you asked someone who was more local and more native uh, in their, in I suppose their family's genealogy, what the origin of these megalithic structures would have been, they would tell you that a race of giants um, built the megalithic structures, but who at some point became cannibalistic in nature and then were punished by being wiped out with a series of or a flood water and i wonder if i'm sure uh, i butchered that to some degree if you could add some clarification to that the nature of these giants who they were in relation to the peruvian people just maybe a little bit more fleshing out of what it is that they believe uh the origins of their megalithic structures truly were okay uh, yes, the Ministry of Culture in Peru is very irritated with the ancient aliens narrative. Um, I don't really subscribe to the ancient aliens narrative, although I always say that the premise of the theory is true, but that's about it. Um, the, the tendency in Peru among archaeologists and historians is to attribute many of the most, in fact, of the megaliths that you find throughout that land in the Andes to the Inca, that they were these master masons, that the Inca built the megaliths, and whether it be Sacsayhuaman in Cusco or Jantaytambo or Machu Picchu, uh, the foundations of Machu Picchu are indeed megalithic. So the conventional narrative is that the Inca built all of this. Um, and it's true that if the guides and the archaeologists and the historians overhear you discussing an alternative view, whether you're walking around with your own group or you're just standing there talking to somebody, observing the walls, it's not uncommon for them to display some degree of hostility. I encountered such hostility in Machu Picchu. In fact, we were very close. My group was very close to getting thrown out of Machu Picchu last time we were there. And the reason why is because there's a particular stone structure uh, in Machu Picchu called the Intihuatana. And the Intihuatana is basically a timepiece. It's a solar timepiece. And it's uh, it's got very intricate cuts in it. It's uh, I believe it's granite. And it it's it's devised to make calcul calculations based on the shadows that are cast from the sun. And they call it the um, there it is. They call it the uh, hitching post of the sun because it was it was a solar timepiece. And I became aware before I went to Peru with this. I, I took a group to Peru with, by the way, Blurry Creatures. It was uh, um, 
we did a Peru trip last year. I went with Nate and Luke from Blurry Creatures and a, and a, and a group of uh, about 40 people went with us. And um, we were touring Machu Picchu and and I was I was talking me and me and my colleague Andres Adazme, who I previously mentioned, were kind of guiding our group around Machu Picchu. And I had become aware previous to this trip that it appears apparently they have discovered, I believe it's in Turkey, another Intihuatana. But it's 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 very similar. I've seen pictures of it, um, and it's very similar to the one in Machu Picchu. And it appears to have the same function. It it looks like a solar device, uh, a device that's that was used to to make calculations based on the movements of the sun. So that obviously is very intriguing because if if it's true that there's an Intihuatana in Turkey then that is proof positive that the Inca did not build Machu Picchu because they weren't around in Turkey. As far as I know, there were no Inca in Turkey. So I was discussing this with my group and we weren't, we weren't, uh, they, for some reason, they, they close off the area where the Intihuatana is at Machu Picchu now in the afternoon. It's only open in the morning for whatever reason. And uh, we couldn't go up there because we were in the afternoon. And, and so we were sort of standing at a different part of the, of the citadel. And I was pointing up to it, talking and discussing the Intihuatana, the Intihuatana and the, and the one in Turkey. And there happened to be a guide standing there. Wasn't, he was not part of our group. He was a, um, what would you call him? I mean, he was, he was a, he was a, one of the official guides, but he was also there to kind of, um, like in a, like in a, in a guard capacity, also walking around, making sure people aren't climbing around on the megaliths, and 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 also eavesdropping and listening to what's being said because they do that at Machu Picchu. But he's an official, an, an official employee, and he heard me talking about this, and I was speaking English. He spoke English. And and making some commentary in Spanish as well. And he literally walked up to us and started waving his hands and saying, wait, 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 wait a minute. You can't say that. You can't say that. Who are you? What gives you the authority to say something like that? Um, are you a guide? Are, do you have permission um, to to basically to say the things you're saying? And I looked at him and I said, I, I don't think I need permission to express an opinion about these stones. Um, and I, I even said to him, I said, what, what, what are we in North Korea? I mean, I'm not allowed to have my own thoughts about this. And what I'm saying, he contending the information. He didn't like it at all that we were, that, that I was saying that I, that I was suggesting that there was a, there, there was an Intiwan, Intiwantana uh, artifact somewhere other than Machu Picchu or Peru. And 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 suggesting thereby that that Machu Picchu was not in fact built by the Inca, that it was built by some other more ancient civilization, a lost civilization, um, and and it clearly and it clearly was not built by the Inca. The foundations of Machu Picchu are megalithic, and then you see where the Inca repaired those foundations and built on top of them, and it's obviously inferior. So they found Machu Picchu. And they built it up again. And Machu Picchu, by the way, is, that's not the original name. The natives called it Ijampu. And Ijampu means the abode of the gods or the dwelling of the gods. And why would they say that? Why would they call this the abode of the gods? Because of the megalithic ruins. So um, the Inca, I think very clearly, found Machu Picchu in a ruined state saw the, the megalithic foundations and, and assumed that the gods had built this place and had inhabited it. And so obviously they were the offspring of the gods, the Inca, in their minds. And, and so this was their legacy. This was their heritage. And so of course they're going to rebuild it and reoccupy it being the offspring of the gods. Um, 
and I'm, and I think the name, the original name for the site reflects that, Ijampu, the abode of the gods. So, but long story short, this, this individual became very hostile with us, me and Andres, and threatened to kick us out and ban us for life and was basically pushing us out of the complex just because we were saying, su suggesting that, you know, the things I had, I, I've said. So, um, there's well, Tim, definitely... this is not something that they're doing because somehow what you're saying is is dangerous, but more so because they're so sick and tired with this potential like ancient aliens narrative and the West coming over and turning, you know, their culture into a history. That's what this derives from it. this. That's part of it. Certainly, that's certainly part of it. But also there's a sanctioned narrative and it's. You know, in this day and age, they accuse you of racism if you say that the Inca didn't build this. Um, you know, you they, they'll tell you you're stripping us. You're why are you trying to strip us of our heritage? Um, which is funny because the Peruvians are not the descendants of the Inca. They're not. So when they say this is our heritage, it's really not their heritage. The Inca subjugated their people. The Inca were a bloodline. They were. They look different. I mean, you look at a picture of Altahuapa. On, uh, on pull, pull up an image of Altahualpa on Google. He was the the Sapa Inca, the the Inca em emperor when the Spanish arrived, when when um, Francisco Pizarro arrived to Peru during the conquest of Peru. He has a mustache, and he's described by the chroniclers of, as being f more fair skin and taller than the. Uh, this is not a this is not commentary on race. This is just historical fact. And so the Inca were a bloodline. It is not accurate to call all of the inhabitants of the Inca Empire as um, as Inca, to, de to, to denominate them all as Inca. Rather, all of these different tribes were subjugated by the Inca. And the Inca were a very particular bloodline. They were, it was the royal family. Only the royal family were the Inca. And everyone else was whatever the tribe they happened to be. In fact, in the city of Cusco, the city of Cusco is divided into four quarters, just like the empire at large, the Tawantinsuyu, which had four sectors. Uh, and and the and those sectors, by the way, correspond to the way that the city of uh, Cusco is divided. And I have this whole uh, there, there, there's a lot you could say there. But um, and in each sector, each tribe that lived in the city of Cusco, subjugated the Inca, had to live and were confined to their sector of the city. And by law, they had to dress in their, in their uh, tribal garb. So they had to dress the way their tribal people traditionally dress, and they had to stay in their sector. They were not Inca. They were subjugated by the Inca. The Inca lived in the palaces. So, um, and some people um, believe that the Inca that at least some of the Inca had elongated skulls. That 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 particular race was an elongated skull race. I don't know. I haven't personally seen evidence of this. Um, the images of the Inca kings, of the Inca princes and kings, kind of um, negates that theory because none of them depict any of the Inca with elongated skulls. However, there are some indications that that might be true. Um, and I saw you pulled up some pictures of Altahualpa. There's a couple in particular where he has a, he has a mustache and some where he doesn't, but there's a, a, a couple where he has a mustache. And I saw one of Waskar that you pulled up. Waskar doesn't have a mustache, but yeah, Waskar was right his half-brother. There he is. He's got a little, little dust. He's right got a little there. stash He there. does have a little mustache. What so, ultimately became of the actual Inca bloodline? They were not, they were completely annihilated. Genocide. Hmm. The Inca were genocided. Um, so this it's a false notion in Peru that, you know, the Peruvians hail from the Inca. They don't. They come from the other tribes that were subjugated by the Inca. And, and, and that's not to disparage the Peruvian people at all. These were all of these other tribes were remarkable in their own way. But the Inca empire, the Inca lineage is gone. It was, it was very purposely eradicated by the Spanish. Um, so, uh, I don't know why we went down that path, but well, we were the point. originally 
going in this direction of whether or not there is, I guess it would have been the stories from the Inca that the megalithic site that they built upon were actually built by a ah, race yes. of, of, of yes. giants. The Inca have no commentary. Uh, well, they don't have any writing. They don't have any writing. They have what's called hmm. quipus. And they have Yupana as well. Yupana was their was their system, uh, their mathematical system. A quipus was their, you might call it writing, but it's not writing. It's it's you've probably seen it. It's like knots. It's strings with knots in it. And this was a very 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 sophisticated um, form of communication. And only the Inca priests and and the and the royal bloodline were privy to quipus. They're the only ones who could read it. And um, so there was no writing. So we don't know what the Incas say about anything. We can't read quipus. Um, so we don't know. We do know, however, what the Aymara people, who are up in the, in the north by uh, south, rather, they're south of Cusco by Puno. They inhabited that area. Very, very ancient people, the Aymara people. And the Quechua people, the Quechua were the inhabitants around the uh, Cusco. Uh, and the Quechuans say that before the Inca came, that the walls of Sacsayhuaman, the megalithic sites that you find in the Andes, were constructed by the offspring of the gods, the giants. They'll say that the giants built them. That's what they say. The offspring of the gods. Right. So the... so. Saksai Waman, for example, if you ask, and you can still find them in Cusco, the, the older Quechuan people, some of them don't even speak Spanish, they only speak Quechua. And if you were to ask them who built these megalithic walls, they would tell you that they were built by giants. So um, that's the, the lore of the pre-Inca people. The, the, and again, the Inca never actually claimed that they built them. So all of the the walls around uh, Machu Picchu, all of the, um, rather, what am I saying here? All of the megalithic foundations of Cusco, when you're actually walking in the city, I'm not talking about Sacsayhuaman now, which is a mile outside of the city. It's kind of, it's really part of Cusco. But when you're walking downtown in downtown Cusco in the middle of the city, and you're walking through the streets, which is really remarkable because as you're walking through the streets, you, you are bounded by massive, exquisite megalithic walls. And they're, the majority of them, if not all of them, the, the, the largest ones are made of green diorite. And I know that the original megalithic foundations of, of Cusco are green diorite. I know that for a fact. So um, somebody was building there long before the Inca. The Inca, what they received was a legacy. They received information and knowledge from an older culture. Now, the Inca were very sophisticated masons. They were excellent masons. I always call the Inca the, the Romans of, of South America. They very much like the Romans, were, were incredible masons, and they, they, were, they built amazing aqueduct, aqueducts just like the romans different kinds of aqueducts so they were they were ingenious um they were ingenious farmers i mean they they invented some some absolutely incredible agricultural technologies and they were a very sophisticated remarkable civilization so i'm not trying to take anything away from the inca would you say invented or imparted I would say that the this the Inca were in possession of unusual knowledge. That's evident, but they didn't build the megaliths. And let, let's let's take one example in particular: the walls of Sacsayhuaman. You go to Peru, uh, Cusco, rather. You go to the walls of Sacsayhuaman. Some of the most impressive megalithic walls, maybe the most impressive megalithic walls on Earth, and Everybody says they were built by the Inca. Where's the proof that they were built by the Inca? None. There is no proof. The doorways at Sacsayhuaman, and this is not always the case with megaliths, by the way, but the doorways at Sacsayhuaman are immense. 
they're built for nine. The, the, you could a nine foot tall person, even a 10 foot tall person in some cases can pass through those doorways. And, and you'll notice the steps, the steps that go up through the citadel of Saksai Waman are, are spaced unusually far apart. So uh, uh, I'm six foot one. My, my stride, those stairs were not built for a guy of my size. If 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 those stairs were were built the way we built stairs, where you sort of take a stride on each step, then you're looking at a nine foot tall guy, uh, which would correspond to the doors. Um, and I think Saksai Waman is unique in in this aspect that it 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 looks like it was built for very large people. Whereas Ojantai Tambo doesn't, by the way, which is also an exquisite megalithic site. Um, but in the case of Saksai Waman, it does. And what's what's really important is to understand that there is no direct evidence that the Inca built Saksai Wama, none. In fact, there is direct evidence to the contrary that's never, never been published officially. I have a friend, um, a good friend of mine named Anselm P. Rambla, who's a Spanish explorer and um, has, uh, has, has done archaeology. He's not an archaeologist, but he's worked with archaeology. He's had an archaeologist on his team, and they were given permission to excavate around Saksai Waman. And it's all documented. And when they were they were digging into the foundations of Saksai Waman, and when they went deep into the foundations, because a lot of that citadel is still buried, when they dug down deep into the foundations, he discovered pre-Incan artifacts. That's it. That's it. That's conclusive evidence that the Inca didn't build Saksai Waman, that somebody else did, because you have pre-Inca artifacts at the foundation, which means that those walls were standing when a pre-Incan civilization occupied that area before the Inca. So what They're happens when found. their historical centers get a, get a hold of that sort of information? Well, they'll never they'll never concede that in Peru because their whole the the whole industry, the tourism industry is is established on the Inca Empire. So they want all so of these is... major sites to be Inca. Not everything. You know, you have the Moche civilization, you have the Paracas civilization, you have all different kinds of civilizations that have their own ruins. But 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 as it pertains to Cusco and the and the Andes Mountains, it's the Inca. It's the Inca Empire. And to attribute the walls of Saksai Waman to a pre-Incan culture, it's almost sacrilegious to them. And it it deflates their narrative. And I'm not saying that a an inferior pre-Inca culture built those walls. What I'm saying is that a, an inferior pre-Inca culture inhabited that area while those walls were standing. Those walls, in my estimation, were built in the antediluvian age by a remarkable civilization that was destroyed in the cataclysm. And, and we're, they were using the same kind of technology and knowledge seen all over the world on every continent. So the point is that we, we, there's artifacts. Anselm documented the artifacts. He took pictures. There were archaeologists on the scene. There were pot, there's pottery shards. There's artifacts of pre-Incan civilizations down when you dig down into the strata and you get down to the foundations. So, so that right there is, is um, evidence that, that the Inca didn't build those walls, but, but you'll never see that. You'll never hear that. In fact, here in the United States, I'm probably the only person who knows, um, but Anselm Pirama has documented it and 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 um, and did great work over there. And I could talk for hours about uh, about Anselm Pirama. But um, so that just gives you an idea of of how misconstrued some of these megalithic sites are in regard to their in regard to the conventional narrative. That's that's literally just concocted to explain their existence. Um, and uh, there's so there's so much you could you you could say about these megalithic sites. Um, I do believe that there 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 was a post flood culture that could still build megaliths on a smaller scale. There was one, the Phoenicians. But 
aside from the Phoenicians, by the way, who built Solomon's temple? Mm. The Phoenicians. Um, who circumvented, uh, circumnavigated Africa? The Phoenicians. Who built the battleships and the and the uh, and the the and the, the so much of the great palaces in in Egypt? The Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians are are a, a an important key to unlocking some of the mysteries of the post flood ancient world. But the Phoenicians, they were the only ones in a in a post flood context, as far as I can tell, who could approximate the skill, uh, the abilities of the Masons that that preceded them in the, in the antediluvian world. And, and also, by the way, the Phoenicians, there were giants among the Phoenicians and they had a cult of giant worship. Now, do you think, uh, so I was, that was the question I was actually going to ask. Is it, uh, was it, is it the people or is it the knowledge that they then are imparted by their predecessors or their lowercase G gods? Because, uh, it kind of just draws some overlaps with, uh, for me, with what's been going on with the UFO narrative where we're reverse engineering some of this stuff that has been left behind, crashed here purposefully or whatever you'd like to think about it. We are working with this technology. It's, it's of my opinion that we're using it right now to talk because I don't know exactly where you are, but David's about two hours from where I am and this is a miracle. None of this stuff is even connected with, with wire. It's just kind of going through the air somehow. Um, where do where do aliens fall into this for you, or at least? Uh, the, you mean specifically? Are you talking about in an ancient context, or are you talking about current. like just in general? Yeah, the current. Well, whatever whatever the narrative is today. Okay, where let do me you put that. Let me let me address both 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 of those things first. In an ancient context, I said that the the premise of ancient aliens is true. The premise. The premise of ancient aliens is that. Mankind has been in contact with extraterrestrial beings since the beginning. That's a that is a biblical fact. That's a biblical fact. That's not ancient astronaut theory. That is a biblical fact. Um, now they get off they get off into the weeds uh, after that. But but I but I want everyone to realize that that is indeed true. Now that does not mean that aliens built the pyramids or aliens built this or that. No, no, that I think is ridiculous. Um, so I'll leave that there. But in regard to the phenomenon today, um, I think it's it's evident that there is an alien presence. And I use the word alien very purposely. Um, alien simply means let's make it let's make it um, specific to sentient beings, okay? Because you can have an amoeba on Mars that's technically an alien species, right? Uh, in regard to conscious beings, alien is simply a race of conscious beings that is not us, that is not the human species. So any conscious beings that inhabit the Earth that are not the human race are alien to the human race now that that applies whether those creatures whether those entities are from mars or whether they're from the inner earth or whether they're from some extra dimensional reality right so that that term applies extraterrestrial is much more definitive extraterrestrial is a being whose provenance is not planet earth so that's different so an extraterrestrial is not from here. Now, you could have extraterrestrial beings who have been inhabiting the Earth longer than the human species, right? They would still be extraterrestrial if they, did, if they didn't originate here, even if they've been inhabiting the planet longer than us. That's an important thing to, to keep in mind when you, when you, when you are exposed to the, the many, many different theories of in in the in ufology um in regard to these entities in regard to these the, the alien presence as i call it so there is an alien presence there's no question that there's an alien presence um the nature of that presence the provenance of those beings that can be debated um and i don't know if i'm answering your question but 
you know, there's a whole lot of, and I'm sure in the, in the, in the comments of these kinds of discussions, you're going to get the usual fare. You're going to, you're going to get the people who say not the aliens are just extraterrestrial, uh, extra dimensionals, uh, not extraterrestrial, extra dimensional, or aliens are just demons, blah, blah, blah. Those are very easy, simple explanations for something that's very complex. And therefore those are very inaccurate explanations. So, um, there's this contention that this alien presence, these entities with whom humanity is interacting and interacting today in a very physical way. We're talking about physical craft, reverse engineering of tangible technology, interfacing with physical beings. Um, that's the kind of interaction I'm talking about, not like psychic interaction or something like that. I'm talking about physical interaction. There's this notion that people want to write off what's called the extraterrestrial hypothesis, completely write it off and say, no, 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 these are extra dimensionals or ultra terrestrials or, you know, again, they come from the inner earth, whatever. The problem is that we know that the craft, their craft is capable of traversing outer space. And obviously I'm going to be triggering all the flat earthers here, but um, <laughs> Do <it>. the, the, <laughs> that, that their craft is capable of, of, of traversing through our upper atmosphere and in, in, in uh, outside of the atmosphere of, of earth. We know that because there have been credible, legitimate uh, video evidence and photographic ev evidence of, of UFO craft, including saucers out there. So it's, so for me, I'm going to say that the alien presence is at least extraterrestrial. Why do I say that? Because if they can fly around in the, in, in, in the, uh, in outer space, then what's going to inhibit them from flying to Mars or having a base on Mars or originating from Mars or any of the other planets in our solar system. Nothing is the answer. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So, um, I think at least we're dealing with extraterrestrials in the sense that they're not originally from the earth. Now, are they inhabiting the earth? And, you know, there could be very various groups here, but are they inhabiting the earth? I think the answer there is also clearly yes. Because I think it's if you do, if you delve into deep into ufology, um, you're going to encounter, I think, sufficient evidence to deduce that. Let's be specific to gray aliens, for example. Gray aliens have bases in the earth and under the sea. I think that's evident. So they're here, um, and they're both inhabiting the earth and also have the capability to go elsewhere presumably in the, in the solar system. So, um, so you see, you have a very complex picture here. There are no easy answers in regard to extra. And I know you didn't ask me this question, but this is where my brain went for whatever reason in regard to extra to extra dimensional hypotheses. I'm open to this. Certainly. I do believe there are more than, uh, I subscribe to the, to, to, uh, the extra spatial hypothesis in other words, that there are more than three dimensions, physical dimensions, something like string theory, where there's, you know, 10 different dimensions to our reality that we currently reside in, that we just can't perceive. So I do subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to alternate world theory. I don't subscribe to the notion that there are a, multi a, a multiverse, which obviously the MCU and so many of the popular movies that have come out in the last 10 years have have made made great use of this multiverse idea um, yeah that premise really caught fire huh yeah way yeah. too much too because if they're conflating a bunch of different theories the multiverse is different than an, than an alternative world theory it's it's not the same and it's not the same as hy hyperspace theory which is what i said that extra there are extra spatial dimensions to the reality that we inhabit that's called hyperspace and uh, I, I I believe in hyperspace. I think that's uh, I think that's part of the fundamental reality of of our world that we inhabit. But but this idea of multiverse 
that's completely different. That is a totally different idea. And then obviously alternate realities, alternate um, worlds are, are worlds that are not within our are not within the known universe. They're like, they're outside of the known universe. These are all different ideas. They really are. They're different theories that, that movies just, they just compress them all together and they confuse the hell out of everybody. Um, and so when someone says, Oh, these are extra dimensional beings. Well, what exactly do you mean? By extra dimension, are you saying that they're coming from a multiverse? Are you saying they're coming from like an alternate universe like Narnia? Are you saying that they're able to access the full spectrum of hyperspace, of our hyperspatial reality? But that's still our universe, mind you. That's still our universe. What are you saying? And the reality is that most people who use that term don't have any idea what they're saying. And so they take this... And, and forgive me for the rant here, but they take this, this very plausible, rational explanation, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and they throw it in the garbage in favor of an extra dimensional hypothesis, which they do not understand. And nobody really does because we've never seen another dimension. We have no idea what another dimension looks like or what what entities coming from another dimension would look like or how they would act or how they would operate. We have no idea because all bets are off. When you talk about a multiverse, for example, you could be talking about a, a plane of existence where all of the laws of physics are different. I do not subscribe to that. I do not believe that's real. That is fantasy as far as I'm concerned. So, so if that's the case, then all you, this is a realm of speculation that, that requires imagination really. And, and I'm not discounting that there's there's maybe something to this extra dimensional hypothesis, not multiverse and not alternative world theory. I, I reject those two on biblical grounds. And that's another conversation. Hyperspatial reality. Yes. Um, and so these are it's very important that 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 people don't try and simplify something that's very complex because you lose the granularity of it. You, it's a very low resolution perspective. And so um, in regard to who these entities are, well, there's things that we know about them. I'm not sure if this was even your question. There's things that we know about them. We know that they have nuts and bolts, bolts technology that we can recover and reverse engineer. And people might say, well, what makes you think you know that? We know that. And you can spend three hours explaining why it's, it's, it's really conclusive that that's the fact, that that's a reality. We know they're physical beings, at least some of them. We know that they're using technology. We know that they die um, and, and can be killed, in fact. So, so we're dealing with a physical reality, and they are, are abiding by at least some of what we understand as the laws of physics. They're not entering into our reality and doing whatever they want, like, like, like the genie from Aladdin. So... We know these things, and so the the extra and we, as I said before, we also know that their capabilities are such that they can easily maneuver outside of our atmosphere. And just as just as they have bases on the Earth, it 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 seems rational to conclude that they have bases elsewhere in the solar system. They certainly have the technology, apparently, to to um, to traverse the air in the same way that they traverse the water. This is apparent. And even in the documentation uh, that's been released by the government, when a saucer goes into the sea, when it goes into the water, it moves through the water in the same way it moves through the air. In other words, the water, it, there is no impedance by the water whatsoever. Yeah, from, because it's not moving through the it's, it's like a, the technology is kind of like actually dragging it forward rather than propelling it forward. That's what, at least what I've understood from Bob Lazar and what he said. The space time, space time, it's not moving, it's, it's not moving through matter. It's moving space time around it. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's moving the atmosphere around it. It's moving, sp it's bending space time. So water and air, it doesn't matter. 
because it's literally it's bending removing space all resistance. There's no exactly. resistance. So, there's no friction. Right. It's not moving through the air. It's not actually moving through the water. It's moving that matter around it. Now, Mr. Alberino, um, before, because I want to respect your time, and we've actually gone five minutes over them. I'm we, sorry. What I, told I you. apologize for this, uh, this uh, rant. No, I, this is fantastic. No, no, no. no. Hey, We're just doing got, this for your sake. I got time for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I want to respect <laughs> it's It's amazing that you came on here to talk with us to begin with. So I do thank you for that. Uh, tr tremendous. Thank you. Um, where do you put the idea? Sorry, just before, you know, you have to go or anything. Where do you put the idea of uh, accounts saying when people are being abducted or uh, uh, experiencing sleep paralysis, the name of Jesus Christ breaks that that occurrence from happening? I, don't, I would never discount that. And I would never I would never um, accuse somebody of lying. They tell me that 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 is, has happened. However, um, the problem is that we have a lot of data from abductees accrued over decades by competent researchers. And within this body of data, there are many, many, many accounts. I shouldn't say many, many, many. There are numerous accounts uh, in, which, in which Christians are enthusiastically rebuking their abductees uh, abductors, rather, in the name of Jesus, to no effect. And, interesting. And in fact, there are some very interesting scenarios in which one case, for example, I believe this is in the work of Carla Turner, the late Dr. Carla Turner, in which um, an individual is rebuking the abductors in the name of Jesus vociferously, enthusiastically, and the grays simply disappear for a minute and come back with Jesus. And Jesus says... No, it's okay. They're with me. Obviously, not Christ, but but a a a. In other words, they saw that the abduct the abductee was distraught, was rebuking them in the name of Jesus. So they wanted to um, diffuse this abductee's panic and fear, and so they bring in a Jesus-like figure, probably a hybrid, um, that. With and I believe this figure had blonde hair and a beard and bright blue eyes and and was was um, um, comforting this abductee, saying, "No, it's okay. They're with me. They're not here to harm you. They work for me." That sort of thing. So there's all kinds of stuff like that. I've heard. And I'm not I've saying that stories. was Jesus. I'm saying that was that was a yeah. Um, I've that, heard stories. that was a deception. Even from one of our members, I believe, uh, stories similar to that where they will have. It, it almost seems like it's within the rules for them to uh, replicate or deceive, just so long as they can get the consent to do so. Well, I've got you know, so that's an, that's the, what I told you there, and there may be something to what you just said, but there's there's what I just cited is stuff that is a particular story that comes out of the data that comes out of out of the abduction material, um, but then. Then I also have plenty of people who I know personally, people who I can attest to that are genuine, sincere believers in Christ who are abductees and who rebuke and, and so forth and, and to no avail. They get abducted. Um, but but here's, the, here's the main thing, okay? And this is what people, this gets lost in the conversation. Most abductees are already incapacitated before the greys arrive. You don't even have an opportunity to rebuke. You're already incapacitated, in most cases, in fact. If the greys are going to come abduct you, in most cases, not always, but in most cases, before they arrive, you're out of it. You're already ready to go, so to speak. They come and they collect you. They've already incapacitated you, most likely through the implants. So um, this notion that the greys show up and you have all this energy to be able to, you know, rebuke and this and that. And Sorry, speak, wait and a second. You just, most you likely... Just, most likely through the implants. <laughs> Just gloss yeah. over that. What are you saying? Well, the the implants that the the greys implant the abductees with very small, about the size of a pill, um, technological device. And I think that part of the, it could, could have many functions, but but one of the one of the most obvious functions would be to control the nervous system and and other functions of the human body and mind, and to render the abductee in a state of um, um, in a state of compliance, right, or or in, or incapacitation. In other words, you show up, the grays show up, and the abductee is just out of it, ready to go. 
and they come and collect the abductee. And that's not always the case. And it depends, by the way, um, the proximity of the craft has a lot to do with this. So can we hold that thought for a minute? Can I take a one minute break? All right. Absolutely. Talk amongst yourselves. (laughs) All right. This would be a good time to toss up our ad. This is, yeah, we'll, we'll toss up the ad. This is a great episode so far. Um, I don't even know. I, I just want to ask him like one more thing, but we're going to play a quick Nado ad and then uh, we'll be back. So here we Today's go. episode is brought to you by Nado Shave Co. Big Shave has been psyoping the American people for decades with their multi-blade razor scam. Eliminate razor burn, irritation, and ingrown hairs caused by deep penetrating multi-blade cartridges. You don't need expensive plastic replacement cartridges. Nado Shave Co. supplies you with a single stainless steel blade like your grandfather used to use. High quality razor blades for a precise and clean shave. The chrome plated Swedish stainless steel blades Made of electroplated brass, the twist to open handle found on our traditional safety razors make changing blades a snap. Whether you're shaving your entire face or just edging up your beard, our single blade provides a barber grade shave for a fraction of the price. Our standard issue includes one traditional safety razor and a box of 100 stainless steel razor blades. Plastic free, 100% recyclable, and $75 allows you to shave for an entire year. And for those who like to use a brand new blade for each shave sign up for our quarter shave club members receive a major discount and pay 25 cents per shave take down big shave and visit nadoshaveco.com to get yourself their traditional safety razor veteran owned family operated and be sure to use promo code nephilim for 15 percent off your entire order that's n-e-p-h-i-l-i-m for 15 percent off your entire order you know what? Jacob, I will say you're correct, but uh, we're not sub 100. We have over 100 on Rumble and uh, from Twitter, the total count probably total oh, count just, right now yeah. is 500 something, whatever. Uh, so it's spread out among a couple of places. Mr. Alberino's back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Smooth transition. That was um, perfect timing. We had the opportunity to run an ad. And good. so uh, what, what were we talking about before we dismounted here? We were, I we were talking about, into... Um, Rebuking aliens in the name of Jesus. Um, I think that's what right. we're talking about. The question I had here, so um, what do you, in your opinion, what is their intention? Because it, every time I look at it, it does seem malicious in some sort of way. Like being being abducted in general is malicious. It kind of goes against code. It's, it's kidnapping. It goes against our code of ethics. So what are these things doing, in your opinion? Well, I would subscribe to uh, Dr. Jacobs' final analysis, which is planetary acquisition. I believe that the Greys are interested in planetary acquisition. Jeez. And, um, and uh, that is their ultimate goal. And I always liken them to the antithesis of the Borg from Star Trek. So in other words, the opposite of the Borg. And if the Trekkies out there will understand what I'm saying, the Borg were this, were this um, they were cyborgs and, and they would, they would, um, they would, subdue and assimilate other civilizations into their own collective. So they would take all of the civilizational knowledge and technology and incorporate it into their cyborg collective um, and do so overtly, a hostile, overt takeover, right? Well, the greys are the opposite of that. The greys do the very opposite. The greys assimilate themselves into your civilization and take over in a subversive way, a covert way. By, by, and when I say assimilate themselves into your civilization, also they assimilate themselves into your genome. So they create hybrids that are advanced hybrids that are that are uh, nearly indistinguishable from 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 regular human beings. And for what purpose? I mean, we could speculate maybe some of the some of the. Um, why they might why they might do this many different reasons, but ultimately, ultimately, I think the overarching objective here is planetary acquisition. So, um, and that is the grace. Now, it does, it does overlap with, I mean, what were the intentions of, uh, of the fallen, of the, the original watches when they, they intermingle with men? It was to taint a gene, a gene pool. It was for dominion over earth to take our birthright. It like these, these motives seem to overlap. Would you consider, uh, current aliens extraterrestrials to be some sort of nephilim 
No, I don't think so. Um, no, because I mean, that's kind of a, it's an interesting question, but it's a loaded question. I'm sorry. Um, I'll be back one second. I Go can, ahead. I can say that with confidence that aliens, the grays, let's be specific. So the, the grays. So when I say aliens, I mean, I'm talking about the grays. Aliens are not demons. That is a, that is a false equivalency. They are not demons. And, 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 and the reason why people get all up in arms about that statement is because they have a, they have a westernized perspective of what a demon is. And, and, and it's very, it's very ambiguous. It's a, it's an amorphous thing, evil, malevolent, uh, grotesque creature. That's what it means to the Western in the Western Christian mind, but that's invented. That is, that, that is the product of medieval Christianity. Um, if you're going to, in your statement, aliens are demons. If if what you mean by demons is the biblical sense of demon, then then you're only then you're only talking about the the disembodied spirits of dead giants, the ne- the spirits of the Nephilim, which are the unclean spirits in the New Testament. That's it, and those are the inhabiting spirits. Those are the uh, the possessing spirits, and we know how those spirits manifest in the world. We know when those spirits inhabit somebody that person is lost to madness they have epilepsy ep- epilepsy oh, what do you, how do you say that um they're throwing themselves in the new testament of the fire rolling around foaming from the mouth screaming breaking chains these are unhinged these individuals are unhinged when they're inhabited by these demons and so you know all you have to really do is is analyze the disposition of the gray alien over and against the disposition of an unclean spirit in the New Testament, and you tell me, do these things look similar? And the answer is no. They couldn't be. They couldn't be more dissimilar. Uh, gray aliens are dispassionate and robotic, and um, and very, very much uh, controlled beings um, who who do not display. They're not emotive. They don't display emotion. On the other hand, you have unclean spirits in the New Testament, demons, which are, as I said, unhinged and ravenous and screaming and writhing. And people say, well, the gray aliens are the meat suits for the demons. But that doesn't make any sense either because you're dealing with the same problem. Why would these unclean spirits manifest in one way in a human being and in a completely opposite way in a gray alien? Somebody explain that to me. Look, if you're going to concoct a theory, fine, but the theory's got to be rational. I mean, I mean, it's got to. Could be- it be because the if these were to be a sort of a biotech meat suit, that they are limited in their capacity for expression in comparison to God's creation? Why? Uh, and number one, why? Number two, why do they want to be in there? I don't think they do. Why would they want to be in there? The gray aliens don't so, even have sexual organs. So the theory what, would go they that they are, they're, I suppose, entrapped in this realm, right? Tartarus, and that they cannot, almost like Al Capone controlling the mob from prison, uh, where he can't be on the outside, but he can still kind of pull the strings. And so the idea is that... Who's Al Capone through, in this scenario? Uh, Al Capone, I suppose, would be like the fallen. Right. And so that through the some devil? technological means, no, like the fallen that are locked in uh, Tartarus. OK, so the watchers. And so, yeah, the watchers. I'm sorry. Uh, and so the idea would be that uh, they can enter this realm through some limited technological means. Outside of just inhabiting a person, possessing a person that they can, I suppose, get here through technology. Right. Sometimes Top and I talk about how it seems as though if you go back through history, there are always these moments um, where society is push, pushed forward a little bit through some sort of technological advancement, and that oftentimes it comes in the form of like some lowercase g god uh, teaching you agriculture, teaching a people agriculture, or you know, fast forward to the Roswell crash, whether or not, like Top alluded to earlier, that was on purpose or not, isn't really 
the point. The point is we recovered some technology from that and that maybe that that technology informs the technology that we use today. And so if you're going, this is obviously theory, right? We have no tangible evidence to support this theory, but the idea is that maybe there has always been a push to get society to a technological level advanced enough that something on the other side of the veil could utilize this technology. Uh, you know, you look at situations like Stargates, and I know I'm dragging you into the weeds here and kind of unprovable uh, Welcome to uh, the show. jargon. Welcome to the <laughs> show, right? Well, I've been uh, but speculating myself, so. Uh, so, it's, you know, I have a hard time, I have a hard time putting, uh, like biblically putting where these, these aliens would fall because they're certainly important in how the next couple of years are going to play out. Like there's, a, there's just been too much, like in, in the past hundred years, too much back and forth and like, like just dangling around this UFO extra, extra terrestrial, extra dimensional. It seems like we're, we're being prepared for something. Something's about to happen mm. and I, and it seems big. How vivid would your portrait of reality be if you were limited to three crayons, crayons to color in that reality? Say you were you were coloring a portrait of reality trying to be as accurate as possible, but you're limited to three, let's say markers, three different colors. Okay. That's what we're dealing with right now. Mm. So we, the Christian community, because, and rightly so, we are based, we are anchored into the biblical narrative. We assume that Everything that happens around us in the universe has a direct explanation inside of this text, the 66 books of the Bible. So every kind of being that one might encounter in the universe, therefore, would have to be an angel, a demon, a human, or God, basically. Right? And so that's what I'm talking about. So you've got like four colors here that you can use to color in this portrait of reality. And, and it's just, it's just woefully inaccurate. So, so we have this desire, uh, and we feel that we are constrained to explain everything, all of reality, the compendium of reality using four terms. Let's be more specific. The compendium of all consciousness in the universe. We feel constrained to describe all of it with four words. Angel, demon, human, God. And I'm saying that is woefully inaccurate. Um, I think we can, we can disabuse ourselves of this constraint. We can take the word demon and we can apply it accurately to to where we see demons in the New Testament, the Old Testament, New Testament, really, and understand that that's a thing. And then we can take this term angel, not fallen angel, by the way. That's I understand what the term means, but that's not a biblical term. So we take this term angel or sons of God, and we can slot that over here where it's appropriate because we can understand it in regard to the biblical narrative. God, obviously, that's an easy one, right? And then human beings, that's easy too. We can put all of those in their places and then allow for a whole um, panoply of other things to exist also. Um, and uh, I think that we have to do that. So we, there is no reason in my mind, there's no, there's no rational, no justifiable rationale in my mind to, to associate a... New Testament unclean spirit, which is a demon, with a gray alien. I don't have to make that association. I'm not compelled to make that association. Um, what is a gray alien? A gray alien is a gray alien. That's what it is. Now, is it entirely biological? Probably not. Is it entirely mechanical or the product of artificial intelligence? Probably not. It's probably a composite. Um, 
I would say it's likely a composite. It's, a, it's some sort of a, a cybernetic biological creature. Possibly there's an AI hive mind there. Maybe. I don't know. Nobody does. It is physical. Um, is it a meat suit? Is it just a suit for something? Well, uh, I don't know. As maybe, but that's just, that's just. I mean, there's there's no way to answer that question definitively, one way or another. But we what what, what we can what we can understand is the disposition of the gray. What what is it like? What does it do? Uh, can you kill it? So we we can answer those three questions um, definitively. It's dispassionate and robotic. Um, it the grays are are occupied for the most part with with processing abductees and yes you can kill them now are you going to be able to no but yes you can because they die so um i have a friend who is an abductee who reached out and grabbed a gray by the neck and squeezed its neck to choke it but she went unconscious which is always going to be the case but let's assume that maybe this gray, for whatever reason, could not incapacitate her. Could she have choked that thing to death or snapped its neck? I'm sure she could have. So, um, so these are things we know. If and when I say we know, and I'm of course referencing the abduction material and people who are being abducted who continue to talk. So, um, so it feels like Tim, if we just turn this corner within the scientific community, and we started dedicating resources to being able to resist the mechanism that they use to cast us into a hypnosis state or put, you know, put us into a, a paralysis state, whatever it is, that we could head kick the little ones, yes. leg kick the tall skinny ones, and end this entire situation. That if they just okay. didn't have that one, because everything is like they are weak and thin and frail. And oftentimes when people come to, I've heard stories where they seem worried. They yeah. seem frantic. They want to make yeah. you go back to oh, yes. I've heard, to, to I've, sleep. Yes, there's 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 historical accounts of that. And then I've also heard several accounts of that from, from modern day abductees. You could resolve this whole problem with a shotgun. If you could <laughs> if you could if you could interrupt their technology. If when they came to get you, Rather than you being, which is almost always the case, incapacitated, laying on your bed, can't move. Rather than that, they come in and you're. Ch -ch -ch. I mean, if you if you could if you could interfere with the control mechanism, um, problem is part of it is um, telepathic control. But but right. but let's say if you could interfere with this mechanism, because part of it I think is the, I think a big part of it, the majority of the control mechanism is the implant, but also that there's telepathic control exerted on the abduct as well. Let's say you were impervious to the telepathic control, and you've been able to disrupt that technological interference. You're gonna, you could, you could, you could dis, dispatch with the Greys uh, until they deploy whatever technology they have from their craft, and you know, and incinerate you. But you could, right. you could blow the heads off of these things. Yes, um, I have no doubt. And now, would they bleed red blood? Probably not. They're not. They're not like us in that sense. Um, you know, so these are probably clones. Okay. So they're biological cybernetic clones. And, and the real, I think, organic creatures are the insectolins. Those are probably organic ones. Maybe those things bleed a little more like we do. But um, and those they seem are, a little bit more formidable. And like reptilians possibly. Would you consider reptilians in the same category? No, I think reptilian is something else, but <laughs> it's so crazy, dude. It's like, cause you, I, you're right. I want to put this in a nice little box, right? I want to put them. Okay. These are demons. We can deal with it now. Let's move forward. But I said, I want to shotgun like blast the box. Can yeah, you like, put yeah. quantum <laughs> physics in a nice little box? No, exactly. I mean, exactly. I, mean, I don't know. Right. It depends on if you're looking on the box, looking in the box or not I looking in the box. So, yeah. <laughs> well, what I'm, cat. What I'm so. saying is putting God in a box. You absolutely cannot. And you've kind of broken down that wall for us again. Thank you for that. Um, you, just, you just can't. There's just infinite possibilities of what is going on. And it's way worse than we think. I, so, yeah, my slogan is embrace the complexity. Don't try and okay. simplify it. Don't be a reductionist. Don't try and simplify it. Don't don't take these few words that you have at your disposal from the biblical narrative and try to and try to explain everything going on with them. That's infantile. And there's no there's no uh, commandment to do such a thing. 
there's there's no um, there's there's no reason why someone who subscribes to the gospel of Christ should feel constrained to do such a thing. Um, I certainly don't. A gray alien is a gray alien. And, and why does it have to have anything to do whatsoever with a demon, number one, or with watchers, number two? Um, it, it, now, can we understand? Can we, can we make an evaluation in regard to their... Um, to their let's say, morality, and that's probably not the best word that I'm looking for here, but, but yes, we can. What yeah, they're look at doing, all is, what they're doing is nefarious, yeah. and what they're doing, they're not asking our permission to do it. I mean, not each individual abductee. They're not, um, apparently, nothing they're doing is beneficial to us. Um, it's, it's invasive. It's intrusive. There isn't. There aren't any real abductees, not contactees, abductees, who want to be abducted that I know of or have ever heard of. Um, you know, it's it's people are being taken against their will, and the, and and obviously this is nefarious. Obviously, this is an enemy. This is an enemy, and and um, that's it. I mean, there's not a whole lot more we can know then this is what they act like this is what they do and based mm -hmm. on what they what they act like their disposition and what they do we can we can make certain determinative de determinative um statements like they're physical and they're nefarious and again yeah. we're referencing specifically the grace um so they're deceptive certainly they're deceptive um, they they create screen memories in the minds of the abductees, so they can't remember the abduction episodes. Uh, they so they're screwing with your mind. They're screw. They're they're implanting their fetuses into the wombs of our females. That's pretty dastardly, if you ask me. That's 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 you know that's pretty uh, uh, cunning, and and certainly um, certainly infringes on any any notion of human freedom and, and, you know, um, it's, it's contrary to our will, certainly. So um, it's not difficult to draw the, what I think is the obvious conclusion that the greys are little evil bastards. And, and, See, and, and I would say more, more specifically, the insectolins are evil bastards hey. because the greys, I'm not sure if the greys are even conscious. They may be, they very well maybe I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure the insectolins are. So, um, for those who don't know, the insectolins are the managers of the abduction program. If you're abducted, brought onto a craft, sometimes you'll encounter them, but they are the managers. They're the ones controlling the grays. Now, somebody controlling the insectolins, maybe, maybe, maybe the Nordics are. I don't know, but um, uh, I think we're dealing with at least four kinds of beings probably more but i i think i can say pretty concretely that we're dealing with four and i was pleased that my friend richard dolan actually has the same assessment um we're dealing with insectolins we're dealing with grays and the gray faction really does include the insectolins but let's for the sake of uh, clarity the insectolins the grays the reptilians and the nordics and i happen to believe that the nordics are the angelic race could be wrong, but that's what I think. So, um, uh, these things are very likely real. The grace, it's a stone cold fact. So if you think they were an angelic race, are you saying, uh, like what, is, what exactly does that mean? And, and then that, that also, does that lend itself to these other things being possibly like, like, like I was saying before, uh, influenced by something that's not angelic. I'm not sure I follow the question. If so, if if one is an angelic race, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, in my book, I Nords? refer to these beings as the elder race. In other words, they're older than the human species. These would be the sons of God. And uh -huh. and if you read my book, you'll understand why I say this. They look like us, rather we look like them, because we're sons of God as well. We're supposed to be. So we're they were they're, we're part of the same family. Now, there are apostate sons many apostate human sons, and certainly uh, a lot of apostate angelic sons. Now, because I use the word angelic, I'm not, that doesn't mean ethereal. So 
it, it's um, uh, and people say, well, aren't they spiritual beings? Yes, fine, but what is spiritual? Because spiritual is not supernatural, by the way. Supernatural is a contrivance. There is no such word in the Hebrew Bible or in the New Testament. It doesn't exist. The word supernatural is not a biblical term, much like fallen angel. These are not biblical terms. Now, I get what people mean by both supernatural and fallen angel, but these are not biblical terms. Um, uh, supernatural means above or beyond nature. And I don't think that I don't think I think there's one being who's above and beyond nature, and that's God. Everything else is within the universe and has to abide by the laws, the same laws of physics, and is all connected synergistically. That's Colossians 115, by the way. So, um, so the, the these are these are a race of beings who exist in the in the universe who are not human but are are affiliated with the human race because they are members of the family. And what do I mean by that? I mean, they're, they're members of the divine family. This is a biblical concept. They're called sons of God. We're also called sons of God. Um, who we're given power to become sons of God, according to Jesus. That's called the resurrection. So we're, we're on the path to being returned to the Father's house and becoming sons of God, of God again, like Adam was, um, and being reunited with our family, i.e. our older siblings, our elder siblings, the elder race. But that's not to say that all of these older siblings are good. No, they're clearly not. A lot of them are apostate, just like a lot of human beings are trash, okay, and apostate and evil. So um, uh, this is, I, I when you, there are some very unhelpful terms, I think, that have, you know, caused a lot of confusion, and, and, and one of those terms is supernatural. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't take issue if people use the term supernatural because I know what they mean, but I think that word is uh, engenders a lot more confusion than it does um, clarity. So don't misunderstand me when I say an angelic race. I'm not talking about some ethereal, supernatural genie thing. I'm talking about a race, a bona fide race of beings who pre-exist us and who have and who hail from a civilization that is much more advanced than ours. Indeed, I would say this is the kingdom of heaven. So um, they're in play and have been in play since the beginning. That's why the premise of ancient, ancient aliens is, in fact, accurate. So they're in play. There's no question. If you subscribe to the Bible, then you know they're in play. Um, the greys, the, the reptilians, the insectolins, I think the evidence is very... Uh, is overwhelming, really, in regard to the existence of the greys. In regard to the existence of the reptilians, not so much. Although, I do subscribe to the notion that such a race exists. Now, where are they from? Are they extraterrestrial, or are they are they a primordial uh, terrestrial race that's been here always, these, these, these reptilians? I don't know. I suspect that that might be true. So, um, you know, it's complex and, and it's like there's no way you can really simplify something so complex. You just have to deal with it and embrace the complexity um, and then, you know, stop trying to stop limiting yourself to three markers, three crayons uh, when, when attempting to color in the contours of reality. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. I like I like I like doing our show where we can go off the rails, but I like it even more when somebody can come on and really, uh, you know, give me something that's going that I'm going to think about for the next week, probably a month or so, and really chew on this. Thank you for, <laughs> thanks for doing that, man, and uh, thank you for coming on. I think I want to respect your time again. We said it like an hour and a half when we before we started, no. and we're like two ten. My I fault. hope you didn't have anything to do. No, oh, it was my I, own doing. Um, and let me let me let me make it clear by the way that I do believe that uh, I do believe that Nephilim are still around uh, giants. Uh, you mentioned earlier, the Kandahar giant story. <laughs> I'm telling you that's that, that story is hundred percent true. Um, uh, we're at least, at least the, the, uh, um, the elements of that story are hundred percent true. Let's say uh, I, so I do believe that Nephilim are still around. It's not that I don't, that I don't believe in Nephilim. And I do believe that, uh, that the 
unclean spirits, the, 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 these, the, the spirits of dead Nephilim are still around and still demon possession is, is actually real, although I don't think it occurs as much as people think, but because but, there's a limited amount of these things. So, um, yes, all of that's real. So I'm not saying, no, that's not really real and only aliens are real. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. Those things are real and they have their place in their category. There's no reason to assume that these other things are even directly associated with those. Might they be? Maybe. Maybe. I haven't heard any compelling theories, though. Um, however, again, to just highlight this last thing, I do believe, now if you want to say, are aliens fallen angels? Now that's an interesting question. That's different than the question, are, are, aren't are angel aren't aliens just demons? That That's an irrational. That's not the question. From, I would I would pose it would it would be more are aliens uh, Nephilim being product of the product of fallen angels and something uh, yeah, else yeah a product well, of, like yeah, somehow yeah. in relation well, well I mean so 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 this is part of this what I was about to say so so are uh, what some of what we're calling aliens and extraterrestrials are those quote unquote fallen angels I think the answer to that question is absolutely yes not the Greys though are the Greys created by, manufactured by the quote-unquote fallen angels, very possibly, very possibly. Mm. Um, uh, are the insectolins the fallen angels? No. No. That's something else. Are they created or controlled by quote-unquote, I hate the term fallen angels, but I'm using it for clarity's sake. Are they controlled by or created by the fallen angels? Potentially. Uh, that's absolutely a plausible theory. Um, and, uh, and I think there may be some truth there. Uh, I don't know, but, but so, so hopefully this, this is, um, making sense to people. I just don't think that aliens are demons in the biblical sense. doesn't make any sense. It's, it's important. And again, uh, so the last sentence that you said there, we, we, this is what we've been talking about. We completely agree. The only thing that we've been doing is explaining it like a bunch of retards. Um, it's, it's important to differentiate <laughs> Because it's true. Don't like if we spit out my drink. <laughs> if, <laughs> if we're going to be battling what certainly we all is an enemy, things like a bunch of retards. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> that's, and that's what I specialize about. in. I mean, you, you got no idea, Tim. It's, it's, it's kind it's, of our <laughs> thing. It's now people are going to fixate. Now people are going to they're going to discount everything we said and just fixate on the fact that we use the term retard. No, the dis, oh, discount no, everything right. I said. Not Tim. But if if you're going to like I like you were saying, they're certainly an enemy and or an adversary. It should. It, we should be specific about what they are. If there indeed is some kind of a culmination coming to a head or a battle or something with them, mixing them up doesn't really help. Being specific about what they are, what they do, their intentions, their motives. They're very. It, they're all very different. So, yeah, we should for the listener base take that into account. Swallow your ego or whatever you were thinking before. Take into account what he's saying. There's a lot of things out there. You know, Bigfoot's out there somewhere. So. Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're not, we're not the only players in the game. Okay. We're not the only conscious beings in the universe that doesn't change the narrative of, of the Bible. It, and it absolutely does not change or alter the gospel of Christ at all. And for some reason, people think, think it does. It does not at all. Uh, I mean, there's something called sons of God angels that doesn't change the gospel they're non-human extraterrestrial sentient beings full stop they are there's no no one could i don't care who you are how many letters you have in front of your name there's no getting around the fact that angels in the biblical sense are extraterrestrial that is a that is a fact so um and i think uh <laughs> I think you know. Put a little bit of thought into it. Most people would would would, would agree, obviously, that that's the case. Um, angels were not created on planet Earth, and and anyone who thinks they were is just I don't know where they I don't know where they would uh, where they would uh, draw that from. That 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 would be a very um, that would be a very extra biblical conclusion, certainly. To think that angels derive or or uh, were are earthborn creatures, they clearly are not, right? So, um, 
there it is. I mean, that's that class of, of beings breaks that paradigm immediately. So if you, you, people who say, well, wait a minute, if aliens exist, then what about this or what about that? Well, you already have that problem with angels. You already have it. Alien, the existence of other beings doesn't, doesn't, um, is not a new problem. You already have that problem with the angelic race. So, and it's very clear that, uh, um, that Jesus did not die for the angels. He died for the human species, for the sons and daughters of Adam. So, um, that, that's a imagined obstacle here. And even the Catholic Church is is uh, wrestling with it, with this imagined obstacle. It's 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 irrelevant, really, because the the we we've, we've been we've been unintentionally, uh, unconsciously grappling with this very same problem for many centuries. There are other extraterrestrial sentient beings in the universe. Period. There are. We, yeah. we no one no 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 Bible literate Christian could ever, ever um, contend with that statement. And to further your point, uh, I like like you said, it doesn't weaken the narrative of the Bible. I think it it actually strengthens it because there is something about our birthright and what we're given and what everything else in play here wants. Because everything want everything that you've been describing seems to want one thing, this similar thing. And it's been given to us. And then even further consecrated, given to us even further by sending his son to die for us. So it's, it's, it's a, man, a very interesting yeah. thing to really and I think would, about. I would encourage people to read my book, Birthright. If you're confused, if you're wondering, if you think I'm a heretic or whatever, go read Birthright. I, I, I take great pains in that book to, um, to describe as, uh, as articulately as I possibly can, my thought process here. And um, I think, you know, for, for people who are confused, um, I think it would help a lot if you really want to understand where I'm coming from here, because I, I provide all of the, all of the um, scriptural references and, and uh, you'll see, you'll see what I mean, which you can get on Amazon, by the way. Yeah, I we actually have your uh, links in the in the description for all the videos here. So I have the book right here. Uh, please go pick that up. I, I you're probably working on other stuff. Tell the people where they could find you and anything else that you want to let them know. Um, I have a website, timothyalbrino.com. Um, YouTube channel, Timothy Albrino. Um, Instagram at Timothy Albrino, and X at Timothy Albrino. Those are the, the places you can find me. Um, subscribe to my mailing list, my email list on my website. I've got some stuff coming out soon, some, some new stuff. I've been working on a lot of stuff, and uh, I've got some exciting projects that I'm, I'm concluding and that are going to be released before long. So um, subscribing to my YouTube channel is also a great way to uh, – all, all of it, the social media stuff and, and the mailing email list if you, if you want to follow me. Absolutely. Yeah, guys, please do. Uh, I know I get a lot of, uh, I, I get a lot of worth out of following you and what you're doing. And I'm glad to see that you're like even more active on X. I feel like that's where a lot of the new dialogue is going to be taking place. Um, th and again, thank you for coming and talking to us. You probably shouldn't have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I liked for... you guys immediately when I saw your intro. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, we like Vinny Pad. <laughs> that's uh, good. That's right. we, always, we always trick people on the way in. <laughs> yeah, David, no, it's, anything... my, it's my pleasure. Uh, thanks for uh, for having me on. At, at any time, I mean, if you have anything new, hopefully we can grow the show to a point where it's even more respectable for someone like you to come on, and maybe we can introduce you to people that don't know you for some reason that if they know us and not you. Um, but anytime, uh, again, guys, end of the month, catch us with uh, we're doing a show with Sam Tripoli. Go to toplobster.com, follow us on social medias. David, anything? Um, yeah, don't forget to go to samtriple.com, click on March 30th, come see us in Summerfield, 
And uh, don't forget to go to our patreon.com backslash Nephilim Death Squad. Sign up for our super secret show, which is going to be, we have to announce when that's going to happen. Super secret show on Patreon only and also uh, our Telegram. Come hang out with us. We've developed quite an awesome community there. Uh, I love that little group. It's growing every day and it's really cool. So if you want to be a part of the conversation, come hang out with us in Telegram. That's it. Absolutely. All right, guys. Peace out. No, the greatest hypnotist on planet Earth is a oblong box in the corner of the room. It is constantly telling us what to believe is real. If you can persuade them that what they see with their eyes is what there is to see, you got them. Because they'll lack in the face of an explanation that portrays the bigger picture of what's happening.